Okay, so recording should be started too. So welcome to our first uh, development stream. Um, so I'm going to warn you now, this is going to be really long. And although I've got technically detailed on this presentation, it's it's not as technically detailed as we wanted to. We wanted to do a stream that gives you an idea of what we're doing, how we're doing it, um, why we're doing it, and what those orders are, um, without giving away any real ways of trade secrets. So we had a bit of concerns a little bit about... Um, some of those items but uh, after going through it analyzing it and thinking about it we're fairly confident we can give quite a lot away here and give you an awful lot of detail on what we're doing where we're up to um and how that's going to work on the back end um without giving anything away that's going to sort of be damaging to us in the long term and hopefully it'll give everyone a bit more of an understanding of what we're really gaining for but if that kind of sort of dry back end source is not for you then you either probably want to pick this up on YouTube later or um, or completely ignore it entirely. <laughs> and maybe someone will do a too long didn't watch. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, so, yeah, wanted to meet the team. Um, we have quite a lot of programmers on board. And although we have said before that... Um, I should probably introduce who we have on stream, actually. So we have myself, Scavenger, and we also have Dave. Um, no videos today. Um, because... Uh, well, it's just an awful lot easier to do a presentation without video. Um, as we mentioned before, we have quite a big team, um, and we wanted to go over that. Um, and we're going to pick up questions towards the end as well, um, but I'll try and pick up them as we go if they're on topic. So, yeah. So, as we mentioned before, we've got quite a few people who are um, professional game developers. Um, or I say professional game developers. Most of them are programmers of some description. We're application developers, at least. Now, there's not yeah. a massive difference between those two. Um, so, I wanted to give you a breakdown here of uh, people's names, uh, what we're actually doing, uh, where their expertise is, and sort of where in where in the project they're working on. Now, originally, we looked at this, and we were going to do something along the lines of providing a list of but what people are working on right this second. But I've split that out and done a bit more into that to kind of detail a bit further on in the stream. Um, main reason being this is going to change. And oh, if this is going up on YouTube as well and people want to go look back on it, you don't really need to see exactly what people are doing. You kind of need to know the area they're working on instead. Uh, so you have myself, um, basically doing uh, infrastructure management um, and project management mainly, but I've also done some things in the engine too, so I'm doing some work on the game. Uh, David, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, I'm working on the API um, infrastructure a lot more. I'm going to be talking about a lot more about the API later on in the stream. Um, yeah, that's me. Uh, we have John, who's um, actually an electronics engineer. At the moment, he's doing, uh, or he specializes in firmware and desktop programming. Uh, he's doing our game developments. You've probably talked to him in Discord. He does a lot of our UI dev designs and programming at the moment. Um, but at the minute, you'll all be happy to know he's working on our XP uh, item systems and what was the other one? Oh, economy systems. So all economy, those yeah. hopefully will be coming very, very soon. It should be quite exciting. No key fact was asking for that one. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> and there are reasons why those have been done in this in a certain order, um, and we're going to get into that as we as we go throughout this presentation. So that is coming up in in a minute. Uh, Reinhold, um, absolute pivotal point, <laughs> a member of the team, <laughs> uh, professional C plus plus programmer, has done an enormous <laughs> amount of work on this. Um, fantastic in in UE4. Uh, currently doing all of Aurelia's animations and uh, programming animations, sort of rather. Um, so it's the technical implementation of getting those animations into the engine and working and then blending together that kind of thing, rather than making the actual animations themselves. But he's also done a load of work on towers, a um, lot of other um, implementation designs, fixed massive amount of problems for us, and has done <laughs> a load of stressing himself out at the same time. Um, so fair yeah. play to him. It's pretty good. Uh, Rafa Essenter, again, I think he completely, I think he actually avoids the public discourse. You may not have run into him. Um, Java, yeah, full stack. He's working on the bot now, but. Yeah. So he's now working on the bot, um, has done a load of work for our AI development and getting that off the ground at first. So our early minion implementation was all Essenter's work. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that was, that gives a really good start into getting, getting those systems in play and working off. Um, he's a Java full stack developer, so um, at the minute he's picked up our Discord bot, but again, understands this entire process flow through the whole thing, which is like, nice for the rest of us, so it's good. Uh, Philippe um, Kanu is a game developer, and he is actually a game developer. Um, works for a, um, I think they're a mobile app, a mobile game developer. Uh, yeah. Essentially, he specializes in artificial intelligence, so he's working on refining our minion AI that Essence has started I'm on. having fun with that at the mill. <laughs> yeah. 
um, wow, the amount of work that he's put into it at the moment is, is pretty yeah, mad as well. Sim, which I could say for everybody, actually, everyone's working um, tenfold, which is really good. Um, but again, we've got to get into uh, objective AI. We've got to get into um, uh, what am I on about? Uh, jungle camp AI, and then eventually yeah. the PV, um, you know, uh, enemy bots. Um, that's going to be a big job. Probably kind of work on matchmaking with question down the bottom there. So. Yes. So, um, yeah, and I think they're going to work together on AI once we get into that point as well, because that's going to be quite a uh, significant feat to one. meet all that. Oh, yeah, definitely. I'm yeah. looking forward to seeing how we actually can even do that at the time. That's going to be interesting. Yeah. Um, AI is not my forte, so it'll be really interesting to learn yeah, off I've the back of these two. Bit, but it'll be interesting to see how it, how what I learned actually gets put into professional use. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you've got Sean Starmec. He does C++ programming. Um, he's currently work, well, working our engine. He did a lot of our base hero classing. So getting uh, the underlying code ready for our ability system, for how heroes interact in the game, for how all that kind of works. Yeah, wasn't it him or uh, Jan that did, uh, said about not using the uh, UE-based ability system? Yeah, I think it was between the two of them. They had a, a yeah. big sit-down and went through it all and found that the documentation behind the uh, ability system that Epic Games does is it's, it's okay, but the documentation's not fantastic. And it, they could stop the, supporting it. It could not. It could fall out of uh, support when it comes to new versions of UE. Um, there's lots of reasons behind it where we could run into our own problems. Um, and both being such strong programmers, again, you know, they, they felt perfectly capable of writing their own. So that's kind of where we where we ended up at. So we have our own ability system. And as a result, they've, they've finished it virtually now, which is pretty amazing. Um, it's all working, it's yeah, replicating. It's yeah, we've got a bit, bit more work on, at least to get it really finalized and a lot of abilities to work on. Um, and personally, I've got to get my head around a lot of the things they're actually doing on that for that side yet. Yeah. Uh, Lucas, um, also Maldonado, a C++ programmer, um, he's currently working on our towers. Um, so when I say towers, I mean towers, cores, and uh, inhibitors. Now, that's a bigger yeah, job than it sounds, together. to be honest, um, which I'm going to get into a bit in a minute, because I think um, we've mentioned API a lot, and we've mentioned it on our Discord, but we haven't really gone into an awful lot of detail as to as to why that's a big deal and we're going to get into that in a moment but it does mean that um, implementation is a little bit more complicated for getting all those in and when we're talking about creating say um, a tower we're not just creating the tower we're creating all the mechanics around those towers and how they work as well and how they function how those figures feed into them um, and how they integrate them with our back-end systems and we're going to go into that in more detail so yeah it's good um joan fish by Fimber, um again c plus plus and web game development um he's basically helped or worked rather with Starmac and completely built our ability system from the ground up. So yeah. uh yeah. That's uh they've been pretty much doing that since day one <laughs> and they're still yeah, doing that now. <laughs> they're still doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew, a fairly recent addition to our team, uh is our web developer. Um so we started off with getting um some basic web infrastructure done, some designs, templates, and everything else. Um as you've probably gathered by now we don't want to do anything by half. We're trying to bring things on and do them properly from the get-go, uh, which means that whatever website we put in place isn't just a placeholder. It's the website we're going to be building on top of. It's the website that's going to integrate into our statistics engine. It's going to integrate into our login and user profile engine. So you're going to see things like, um, you know, you're going to be able to log in the website and the game and the launcher, and you're going to be doing this from the website you're going to be using from day one. Um, even if that day one website, which is coming very, very, and I, I, I know I said it before, but very, very soon, um, uh, will only be sort of a placeholder of this is what we, where we are now and what, what we can show you in our adverts and news and you can sign up for our newsletter. Um, more fair things are going to come into that website and those things coming into that website are going to be, you know, built on top of continuously. So you're going to see an awful lot of that and it's going to just move at a nice pace once we get that initial uh, release out and it's going to be coming out very soon. Um, Okay, so we've got Cole um, of VX. He's a general programmer, does various other bits and pieces. I can't remember what he actually does a job now. It's kind of slipped my mind. Um, but essentially, yeah. he's working on our launcher primarily at the moment. He's also able to work in UE4. Um, but we need to get that launcher working for um, uh, patching, isn't yeah, it, really? Yeah, it's the, really it's... Uh, getting everything really... Make it easy for everyone to be able to actually get access to the game itself. And download it in chunks. 
so that we're not yeah. downloading the entire program every single time. I think we've time. got a few slides on that anyway, on this one anyway. Yeah, there's a lot of slides co covering most yeah. of this anyway, so we're going to see a lot of those coming forwards. Uh, Matt is our data analyst. Um, at the moment, he's a little bit idle. We need to get more work from him, but um, that's mainly because he's, his specialty is databases, and he's worked on getting our database infrastructure on the back end. But as we've got a lot of that in place now, we need to. Um, he's going to be doing a lot of our uh, big data, so making sure that the an analytics, analysis, yeah, analytics, analytics work properly and that they're yeah. properly stored and, and they're optimized and all that kind of thing. So um, yeah, currently, I think I'm more working on getting the ingestion side of that sorted. So yeah, but once that's done, really you know, been, it's, it, once it's done, he should then have enough to be able to work with. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I mean, at least he's um, yeah, fantastic, able to consult us on those uh, specialist subjects yeah, we definitely. need uh, when we need them. So um, yeah, that'll be more for the long term, but definitely coming up soon. Um, Steve, or Dusty, is our DevOps engineer. So this is to do with build servers and Azure infrastructure, and he's working more with me and David um, to do administration work and all those kind of things. Um, and again, more details are going to be coming up on that, but yeah, really it's well, to do with the back end. Yeah, more back end, but then also we've got, he does all the company-wide administration, things like our storage servers and things like that. Um, yeah, so we're using Office 365 for a lot of our management and infrastructure and um, source controls. Oh, not source control, sorry, uh, backup solutions um, and uh, documentation control is what I meant. So yeah. kind of gives us a good way of uh, controlling all that. That's kind of a big job. That's why there's two of us. <laughs> yeah, we're almost three now, which is the uh, luxury item because it was getting a little bit um, heavy on that. Well, the administration um, side, yeah. Yeah. So, thank you. I think that's settled down a bit now. Um, now yeah. we've finally got things actually planned together. It so was, that's really yeah. Cool. Well, when you have when you have like seventy odd people to try and sort out passwords, and that's why it's an absolute nightmare. <laughs> yeah, especially when people keep forgetting their passwords. Thankfully, we now have self-service password reset because that was killing me. Oh God, that was the best thing I put in there. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's cool. Uh -huh. Christian, or attention head, uh, he's an AI and data engineer, and he's going to be working on our matchmaking engine and AI um, a bit more in the future. Mainly, he's going to be sitting on matchmaking at the moment. Um, we felt the need that um, specialist matchmaking skills and the yellow skills were really important, um, which I think we all would agree on. And yeah. uh, the previous um, existence of matchmaking before VG formed, uh, let's just say, wasn't overly good, and we want to improve on that. So, <laughs> yeah, we have all <laughs> new matchmaking coming. Yeah. Along with um, uh, those matchmaking things, not only do we have uh, somebody now who's able to work on it, and Christian's fairly uh, new and only just come on board to the team because we've only just really settled on getting that logic for the back end working on how we want the matchmaker to be formed, programmed, and actually work. Um, so that's really only just coming in now. Although we have got a matchmaking service in the way that it will search for games, match you with the game, and log you into it. Uh, this is really about, you know, how do we find people by ELO? How do we how do we define what that ELO is? Um, make makes sure it's you recorded happy correctly. when you want to actually join a game. <laughs> yeah, and make sure that it's it's reasonably balanced. We've got to get that as close as possible. Yeah. Um, it's never going to be perfect. It's something we're always going to have to refine. But getting that matchmaking service running as a central service behind the game as a server service is going to be a huge win. Um, yeah. it, it's it, it, I think I, I think I'm right in saying, and I can't remember exactly where I heard this, so I can't put it down for anything else. But I'm pretty sure that um, Paragon's matchmaking was uh, uh, client side. So essentially, what they did was every person wanting to join the game broadcast saying, "I am, I want to join a game," and then it would try and find your yellows and try and find people who were broadcasting four games. And as a result, it was very hard to find people who should have been on a team together. Um, yeah. And that yellow was just—I I don't know—there was something. Of, I think I think I'm not the only person in failing it. It didn't quite work, and that they were hoping. I think they were uh, Epic Games were even thinking that, and they were going to improve it. And then, unfortunately, we never got to feel the fruits of that. But yeah, it's definitely something we want to make sure we do right. So yeah, there's several of us working on making sure that comes out. But again, more of the logic is going to be coming up in this presentation. So yeah. without further ado. I wanted to get into our SDLC pipeline. So SDLC is software development lifecycle. It's in any enterprise, what is the process of creating the piece of software you're trying to create? And it doesn't have to be a game, it could be an application. And um, this is where we come into uh, planning, source control, build and release, and hosting and monitoring. Now there are much more complicated diagrams in this, but I wanted to keep it simple well, yes, so that it everybody can follow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I've tried to, 
yeah, well, I've got a diagram for this at work, and it, and it really is a spider diagram. It's got more legs than you can please and imagine. It should be called a millipede okay. diagram. So I guess it's also like an A1 sheet of paper. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, it's a whiteboard. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's massive. Um, but I wanted to make this simple enough that the overall process can be understood by everybody. We don't want to go over everyone's heads with this. We've... Um, the problem with technical resource, uh, technical jobs is that we never do this. We never sit no. there and talk to you guys about how this process works. No company in the world, as far as I'm aware, has sat down and done a development stream that says, this is our internal delivery process. They just say, look, we're making the game. You just have to trust us, and that's the way you end of it. And I wanted to do something that kind of gave you a bit more detail without going that that, that further on. Yep. So, um, essentially, this broke down into into these four major pieces. Um, so we need to make sure we plan out what we're doing, and we we have a program called Trello, and I'm gonna, each one of these items is going to have its own slides. We're going to talk into a bit more detail, um, which is essentially a way of creating um, an agile planning environment so that each person knows what task they're doing. Everyone else knows what the person is doing. They can collaborate on a piece of project on a piece of uh, work. They can provide um, documentation, um, evidence. They can request help. They can tag each other. Um, if they complete a piece of work, they know that that goes to another team to maybe QA test, to test it, to try it, to bug find it, whatever, uh, and pass it on elsewhere. And when they are looking for work, they know what work needs to be done next and that they can pick it up. So it, res it removes the need for micromanagement. Also make sure you don't miss anything when you're coming up with what it is you need to build in your game. I'm um, going to come up with an example of that in a moment. Yeah. Um, source control. Uh, we're using an application called Plastic SCM. We started it's off with... Actually um, a real bad one to find because I don't know for some people especially the bigger companies they use a system called Parforce it's expensive oh yeah really expensive the licensing was like 700 pound per person so we thought well I did a bit of digging and we actually found plastic SEM which are actually a very nice company um, to use and it was very small we couldn't find them but it was like tucked away in one of the um, UE forums, so we thought we'd try it out. And, so, and yeah. it really surprises me because their sales team has been really helpful. And not only that, mm. is that, and they come in a lot cheaper. Um, yeah. They even come up with a package that we can move on to later on when we want to move up the scale and, and have some funding that we can actually afford to go, to do more with it. Um, yeah. So that that's you know, yeah, been a really big win for us. Um, we started off with Git, but we found that blueprints couldn't be merged. Because so you oh can't God, have more than one person. Files, it was just absolute hell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, we'll, tell you, we'll, we'll touch a bit more on, the, on that detail in a moment because yeah. we're going to come back to that. Um, just to answer it, nobody. Um, he's asking about planning for servers and scalability. Uh, that is going to be coming up in a moment. Um, I think nearly every question I've seen so far actually is coming up in a moment. So, yeah, yeah. stay tuned. We'll hit on them. Um, what I should do is pull up my laser pens so I can actually highlight things. Look, Whee, laser pens. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> I think that's a laser pen, was it? Oh no, that's a laser pen. Yeah. Yes, a here we go. Happy days. So Jenkins um, is a build server. Um, what Jenkins essentially does is it compiles programming code, or rather, it runs tasks and can compile code. So it does jobs you, you tell it to do. So in this case, we can say uh, we tell Jenkins to go to our plastic source control to pick it up and uh, do something with it, turn it into an actual playable game, and then deploy it to somewhere that it can be downloaded by our team, by our staff to test it and try it out. Um, again, we're going to go into more detail, so I'm just going to cover this really, very briefly. Um, the hosting and monitoring, um, so for how we're going to handle servers, uh, including matchmaking, API, website, uh, orchestration, containers, individual servers, Basically, all that's going to be handled by Azure. Yeah, yeah, pretty much everything that isn't actually Unreal running on your PC is going to be running on Microsoft Azure. <laughs> Sorry um, guys, we're going Microsoft here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I know there are others going with um, uh, AWS, I think. But um, yeah, I, 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 I think you know several of the team have got experience with both Azure and Amazon. I don't think there's a big difference between the two. Um, I think it was just the fact that Azure had a nicer uh, because uh, they have a setup system and also the um, Microsoft's um, uh, partnership system gives us the uh, free credit to be able to run this. So. We're actually using free credit to run the entire development system at the minute. <laughs> yeah, which is amazing. And it gives us the option to use um, 
<laughs> will Sony have something to say? Uh, Sony shouldn't have something to say over this. They don't really care. Um, the Sony don't have their own cloud cloud so, um, sourcing solution. It doesn't really work like that. No. Um, it's not so much about what do we do as far as our hosting platform. With you know, you can't. They won't sit around and say you can't use Microsoft for that. Uh, it's more about how you handle players inside the game that can cause issues with what yeah, Sony it's, licensing it's more, agree. It, yeah, it's more if if you have an Xbox, a player playing an Xbox, and they can see a player playing in PlayStation, then that's where it gets more complex, and that's where Sony say no. Yeah, this is why they've turned around and said about Nintendo, which is the whole issue with uh, Fortnite at the moment. Um, so if you're on mm-hmm. DS, you can't actually do it. So we're going to work around those things. Just Again, you've got to work around terms and conditions and policies based on what those companies agree. Um, but no, as far as hosting is concerned, that won't be a problem. So it shouldn't be an issue. So I've split these down into each individual um, component so we get a bit more information about them. So our planning system kind of creates this way of us pointing out uh, what is our gaming backlog. So right now, as you're all aware, we don't have an XP system. Um, we don't have a coin system. Um, so those are in, in, in uh, are being worked on. So you might find that something like coins is in backlog, or the item shop in this case is in backlog. Uh, but the X system, XP system is the next priority in line. Um, we break things down into what we call sprints, which are... Yeah, I sort of did a mock-up Trello board, so I didn't give us away anything we're actually working on. Um, <laughs> Trust me, it gets bigger. <laughs> yeah, I was, just, I, I was surprised. Well, we had we actually had to split up into multiple boards, and then I think we got like yeah, four so we programming have, boards. Yeah, like, we three boards for the programming side. Because <laughs> um, we, we started getting too big and too complicated, we just couldn't follow it all. So that's nice. Yeah. Uh, so what we had to do with this... Um, Yes, the API, see Sprint 1 and other coding in this case. Um, the idea is you can see who is working on something. Uh, you can see anything attached to it. If you've looked at our public uh, Trello board um, with just what we're sharing with you guys, you can kind of see who's been adding what to it and all that kind of thing. That's the kind of luxury you get, but you get to do it in a more uh, development perspective. Uh, QA, towers being complete, so quality insurance, and when it's complete, whatever is complete. I'm going to go into more detail about what we've actually completed. But the idea is it's, it follows this nice process flow of doing it. The biggest challenge behind project management we had with this project is that because we're all doing it in our free time, uh, it's very, very hard to say, right, sprint one is two weeks, and I want you over there, Dave, to go make me an API in two weeks or whatever. It's just... I'll, have, I'll tell you, good luck and go away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, it ain't going to be done in two weeks. But yeah, no, it's... I don't know how long, how much time you can really commit to or something. It's impossible yeah. to give people deadlines. So we've got to work to the best we can and the capacity we can and try and create a... Well, yeah, it is an agile working system, I guess, isn't it? It has to be quick. Yeah. It has to be dynamic. It has to allow people to work as they can and when they can and see what those dependencies are when those happen. So we've created a system around that. And I think most of the teams now on VG are actually using Trello in different ways. So that's really cool. Yeah, we do have a Trello board for most of the teams now. But yeah. then I know we have also some people are moving over to um, the Microsoft way as well. Um, oh yeah, yeah, Planner, Planner. which so, is virtually yeah. the same system anyway. It looks it's almost identical. System, just on, yeah, there's very very little difference. Yeah. So yeah, that's really good. Uh, our source control. So those who don't know what source control is, source control essentially is a central source that holds on to all the code into a single pot. And then let's everybody download a copy of it. So if you think about uh, in game terms, just imagine it like a game where everyone gets a copy of that game in its latest form and you download a copy and then you go and play together. Well, it's the same idea for programming. Um, you all have the central source of code. You all download the patches to that code. And when you make a change, you push it back up so everyone can share it. Yeah. Um, so we have that now. We have 15 people currently working on that. Um, the two people on the team who I probably should have mentioned that about that, which are not on the original Meet the Team board because they're not technically programming team, um, would be Almighty, who we've all met, and a new guy called Okao. Uh, so one is technical sound and the other one is technical artist. Uh, difference being between a normal artist and a normal sound guy is that instead of just making the content, they're actually capable of programming the content into the actual application. Yeah. So, yeah, that's really cool. Um, but that's essentially what we're using. So that's all the that source that source control really does, and all that plastic really does is it takes those and it keeps it all centrally controlled. And what it also gives you is version control. So the nice thing about that is that if somebody makes a mistake, someone deletes something they shouldn't have done, someone has another problem with it, we can roll an individual piece of programming code back. Yeah, or the whole yeah, project we back. See, we can see the entire history of, it, of every file in the project as well. So it kind of 
makes it nice and there's actually special plugins that have been put into Unreal where you can actually see history of an actual blueprint which is even better because blueprints are binary files which means they don't have any structure or any notable structure that we can actually then decode so being able to see the, the history of a set of nodes in a blueprint makes it so much better when coming to uh, try and fault find things Mm. It gives us some nice patch notes as well, um, so we can keep an eye on the history as a, as a whole and, and what's yeah. changed each night as people are pushing in. Um, I've got some screenshots of that, so I'll bring that up in a minute. Yes. Um, we are using Git as well. Um, we're using that for our launcher, our API, our bot, matchmaking service. It's basically anything yeah, well, that isn't anything that isn't Unreal is in Git at the moment. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the one we're not using Microsoft for. We're actually going to be uh, we're using GitLabs for that hosting side that yes even after GitHub. microsoft by github yeah <laughs> yeah so. if they can sort out a way of being able to put active directory into github i'll be happy but at the minute i think once they GitHub. bought it i'd be surprised if they don't i'd be yeah, very surprised like if they it. don't so that's quite a good one yeah so yeah that kind of covers source control it's, it's fairly simple animal um but it has to be there otherwise you can't collaborate and you end up with a mess of everything else um we're also letting all our artists, um, sound engineers, concept artists, all that, they all push into a uh, SharePoint type system and then they tell us when there's something that needs to be integrated into the game. So we'll download the files we need and we'll check them in as programmers and get them into the engine and working in the engine. Yeah, so yeah, I know um, that's what Almighty does a lot of work with is getting things like the models into the engine for us to then work with. And then, yeah, Oak will then put the sounds into the engine, but he'll do a lot more. He actually does more than what... <laughs> I think Almighty's yeah. yeah, I think Almighty's working on um, a materials library too, which I think he wants to show off to yeah. everybody at some point because he has some way of making materials on heroes um, change, is that a shop way or something, or is well, that separate? We're, yeah, we're, uh, the material layering system that he wants to do for the heroes and being able to buy materials or put new uh, custom materials, he's having to block at the minute because Unreal haven't actually got it in their engine yet. It's planned for twenty. 120 oh, but they okay. haven't actually started implementing it yet so we've had to block that one at the minute because i've actually oh, got okay. all of the uh, api stuff ready for that or well in planned but it just needs to go in but i can't do it until unreal stick that in so oh that'd be pretty neat once so once yeah that's coming soon. that sorted then that'd be cool fine. yeah so we've got we got lots of other things and some and more things will be shown off in the future but yeah it gives you an idea of how we get them into the engine so all that goes into jenkins now jenkins is a build server um, so I'm gonna we're gonna show off a little bit now what we're doing for builds. So we technically have a Linux, MacOS, and Windows build. So all three actually get taken from our source control, compiled, made into a runnable game for those three platforms, and in theory run and work as well. That's as, as well, best they do at the moment. <laughs> I haven't got the only the only Mac I've got is the one I'm the VM I'm running to actually build this. So. Um... Yeah, I can't, we can't actually test on Mac Linux. I did a one test on my dad's Mac, but it failed because he's got a MacBook Air and it doesn't play games very well. No, um, that makes sense. Which is why we we say we can build for these operating systems, but we don't actually have any sort of test plan for them. So that will have to come on a later date. We're still, for instance, uh, I think Quick's actually fixed an error yesterday that caused the build to fail on Mac. So we are still continuing to make sure that it will actually run and compile, but we won't actually be able to do any testing until we have more people that have that hardware. Hmm. The exciting thing about this, or rather the important thing about this, was we wanted to prove that we can build from multiple de um, multiple operating systems um, because eventually, as you know, we want to try to go to con go for consoles. So once we get the... Um, agreement from uh, the console vendors that we can have a, de a dev machine and actually build for those devices we can get those devices pushed into the build now the interesting thing the important part about that is that this tells us when there's a compilation error so if we put a piece of programming code in that does not work on one of those systems it tells us what doesn't work um it doesn't really tell us how we fix it but it tells us what's wrong so we can kind of, we yeah, can get in so there and sort it if you think of it as a way most of these are all they are really is just it's a job and inside that job it just basically runs a whole load of commands one after another in, it's the same as if you opened up cmd on your computer and started writing commands it basically just does that one after another automated for the clients they get done every 
night, uh, 12, uh, 12 o'clock UTC time. Every single night it does a new build for both Linux, Mac, and Windows for both uh, uh, for clients. And then it does a Windows server and a Linux server. And then it also, as you can see, it does a Linux Docker container and also a, that's it. And it also pushes the Windows build to our storage site so then staff members can download it. Um, the others, so for instance, the API and deployment, they are actually more triggered from when a piece of code is pushed into GitLabs. It, so when, for instance, I've worked a bit on the API and I want to push it into the, the um, into Azure itself, I will compile it, push it into um, master branch, and then it will shove it and get it compiled and then pushed onto Azure. So it always keeps it up to date with the master branch of our repository. Yeah. Um... So yeah, the, the lovely thing about that is that every day we can fire up a brand new version of the server on demand and it's the click of a button and we can get all of our staff to all just go get the latest copy themselves. They can test it. So mechanics can walk around the map. They can see how long things something takes. They can say, oh, we don't like this. We need this to change. We can make that change the next day. Immediately they can go and do that exact same thing. They can go test it and make sure it all works. So that's really nice. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, so all kind of proves, and that all proves it all works as it does now. Um, so that's all going through the build. And this kind of feeds back on to uh, where we're talking about patch notes. Um, so this gives us our patch notes of what we've done each day. So, um, you know, some things. One way you've done a lot of stuff. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. It was just typical of when I put the presentation together, and it was last weekend. And I did a lot of pushes. But realistically, this is normally filled with quicks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think Zimich is on there a lot at the moment as well. So this changes day to day. It, this is not necessarily a perfect representation, and it's not meant to show that I'm doing more than everyone else because I'm not. There's uh, a lot of people putting in a lot more work than I am. So um, yeah, it's good. But yeah, you know, we can we have a way of tracking what we're doing. Your organization, so I'm doing other things. Yeah, so yeah. but actual frying engine. Yeah, you'll find the Ospil's name on here a lot more. Um, Dave's Ospil, uh, Quicks is on here a lot. Um, Almighty Quicks. Those are, yeah, is the main bunch that tend can. to push in a lot, a lot more. But again, it, yeah. it depends on the size and scale of what you're working on as well, if, and and how you work on that. If you do something that's yeah. a, an awful lot of changes where you've locked out the files for a long period of time, then um, it's it's probably possibly one commit. Whereas, yeah, you know, I tend to be a little bit more. Um, uh, well, so I break them down into smaller chunks. I'll make small changes yeah. and, and push them all through. So my name will show up more, but doesn't necessarily mean I've done as much. Yeah. So uh, that actually reminds me. We didn't say anything, but the um, plastic SCM. In, if you've used Git before, it's actually a little different. Uh, with Git, you all um, you have a copy of the entire repository on your computer, and uh, when you update it, you actually basically push code, and then it will try and do a merge. With something like Plastic SCM, you actually lock the file. So when you're using it, no one else in the entire team can actually edit that file. Or well, they can edit it, but it's very hard to. Um, so it means that we don't get conflicts like, and merges. Yeah, because with files like the blueprints, as I said, it was binary files. Um, the compile uh, the the the, the um, SCM or Git doesn't know how to to merge two of these files together. So we have to ma either manually merge, or if we use this system, it just locks them out so no one can use it until you push it back in. It does mean, though, that sometimes we do have to kick people because they've forgotten to unlock it when they finished, and gets interesting. But yeah, but hopefully we don't get the same errors we got when we first started out, which was when people edited the same files and then we had merge errors, and we were basically oh, having God. to copy and paste code from left to right mm -hmm. and then work out it why actually... it wasn't working. Oh. It would have been easier for us to have just said, right, sod it, deleted everything and started again. <laughs> yeah, I really think of, it was. I think we, even though that was like three months ago, we're still sometimes getting those merge errors creep back in, which is just... A lot of them have gone now, I think. We've, we've, a lot of them have gone, but I have remembered at least a few weeks It's been back, a couple. There has going. been a couple. It's been surfacing, yeah. I think some of that was to do with shelving errors as well. Which I think oh, was cool. part of the problem, but that seems to we think we've got the bottom of that as well. But yeah, when we because we never really worked with um, Unreal in a um, source controlled environment before, it took us a bit of time getting up to board with how that really should work. So that took a bit of time. Yeah, because a lot of people have been doing this on their uh, on their own, but when it comes to actually pulling everyone into a team, 
trying to work out how the files and that how you share that is where we've been learning a lot. We took about. I think I, I'm not. I'm not going to be around the bush. I think we lost. Well, I say we lost. We didn't lose work, but we did lose two weeks of yeah. fixing fixing issues um, rather yeah, than that actually because of that get that get merge at the end. Because when we got to it, we had like different branches and everything was all over the place. It was a mess. So, we but luxury. Spent two weeks sitting there <laughs> trying yeah. to get it to fix. But the nice thing is now once now we're back into this position, you know that that's solved, and we're not going to go through that again. Thankfully. Learn our lesson. Oh yeah, definitely. And that's that's the nice thing about this. I mean, we're all you know we're all going to learn things as we go along from each other, from from the process, and um, from all sorts of different things. So um, yeah, we'll learn as we go along. We'll make sure we don't make the same errors twice and uh, get it right. And now we're going for you know final release two. If we make a mistake, we're going to be quite willing to admit it and um, make the change and fix that. So there's some questions about servers, how we're hosting them, what we're doing with them, um, and this is really where it kicks in. So we've mentioned Jenkins already. Um, so this big blue arrow really just points out is that what a Jenkins does is it takes our build, gets it, compiles it, turns it into a game, takes the server version and it pushes into what's called a container registry. So this is a server holder. This creates a individual server for um, a single game of uh, Phoenix Rising. So that is just yeah. the 10, 5 versus 5. Yeah, so it's basically we've taken what you can run on your computer as a, as like a dedicated server, put it into what we call a container image. That image then gets stored in the registry, which we can then use to deploy to basically anywhere, anywhere in under a certain amount of time. Uh, yeah. that image is basically a a technical thing. It's it's a it's it's based off a of Linux image. Um, trust me, if you want to try it. Be my guest, it's absolutely hell. Um, <laughs> you've got to try and get all the right libraries in there. You've got to install all the right um, stuff into it. And yeah, I had fun with that one. <laughs> Don't want to do it again. But now it's there. It means that we can it's deploy a... It, it, automatic, it automatically pushes every night um, to keep up with everyone. Um, and keeps up with the uh, uh, Jenkins stuff. So yeah. Yeah, but the nice thing about this is once we have that image in the container registry, we can go and say, right, give us a server, and we get the latest update server sent into what's called ACI, or the Azure Container Instances, and we have a live server. And we can run that for as long as we like, or we can close it down as soon as we want to. And the nice yes. way that containers work is you pay for its startup and then realistically per minute of its actual runtime. Now, what we're looking at is with uh, recycling servers, so they're always up to date um, and making sure those come out. I'll cover that in a second. But the internet, but what I've tried to cover here is we have green ticks on everything we currently have done. So these three areas represent different regions. So we are looking at doing multiple region support. Um, but, but that's where things come in a bit different because we don't want to show you the regions there. So yeah, well, we haven't decided what they are just yet. It all comes down to what Microsoft will support, and they don't support everything yet for Azure Container Instances, but they, yeah. they are getting more. At the minute, they do do North America, South America, EU, Southeast Asia? Yes. And Australia, I think, is what they currently yeah. cover. Though but this, more are coming. This is all all over the place because, for instance, this one, the SQL databases are actually going to be aren't probably going to be there. I'm still working on how the API does that because those SQL could go and because I found out that Microsoft have handily now brought out multi-read write, uh, multi-master Cosmos databases, we might be able to get rid of those SQL databases, have one SQL database or set of SQL databases and then use the multi-master Cosmos database as a full uh, cool. okay. um, access. But that's something that I'm working on at the minute. All right. So that's cool. So basically what we're covering here is Cosmos DB. Uh, Cosmos DB is a database service. This is what holds your things like your username, your password, your profile, your information, what you've bought from us, what you've spent, what information you need when you log in, uh, which masters you've unlocked, your masteries, your XP, your level, everything you can think of that ties to you as a gamer. Um, Cosmos DB is automatically or already uh, globally scaling. So if we want to deploy this into North America and the EU and we use Cosmos DB, we can grab that information regardless of where you are. Yeah, yeah so it doesn't matter. About... It will stick it wherever we want it to go. So it's independent of this whole mentality at the minute with gaming. Gaming at the moment is 
I'm in EU, I'm in NA, if I want to move region, it's going to mean that I have to start again, or I can't play with my friends because they're in a different place in the world, or it's going to give me latency issues. This is a way that we can create that is going to allow us to bridge the gap in those different regions and create a much more user-friendly environment. And this is something that a lot of other gaming companies are not doing at the minute, because we want to really innovate and prove what we can do. So yes, this SQL area might actually change. It might actually end up being a single one or not exist at all. We might not need it. Um, everything with the green tick is done. So we've got one region fully operational right now. Um, we are using uh, West EU at the moment, something like that. So that's no, all okay. We're using most of the stuff is currently because I'm doing working on it. It's currently in the UK self, but no UK um, self. There we are. So either way, it works for now. Um, so we have the API up and running. Um, we have a SQL database. We have Cosmos DB running. The container registry is all working, and our website is up and running. But you'll see that very soon when we release it. Um, Matchmaking will come up as two, and this is really going to be about where the pattern comes into how you connect to something. So how this works is you as a user or a gamer will have your game, and you will try to connect to a game. That game will go through what's called a traffic manager. Now, you don't see any of this, obviously, because it's hidden. So you go through the traffic manager. Traffic manager automatically, it's not a load balancer, it's a traffic manager. And the difference being a load balancer picks out, like, four or five servers and says, right, okay, there's 10 people on this one, 10 people on this one, 10 people on this one, there's four on the other one. So therefore, we'll put you on the one with four because we need more on that one and it, to keep a balance. Yeah, Hence, load balancing. Traffic managing but allows one, so, us... Sorry, but uh, with uh, load balancer, it actually does it on the TCP level. So actually all the packets get routed um, when, yeah. it, when it checks. You get, your packet gets sent to it, it then does some maths and then sends the packet off, which actually adds latency to that packet. Yes, but what it does do on this... Oh, you mean on a load balancer? Yeah. On a load balancer, that, that adds latency by having... Because you, it still has to buffer that packet before sending it off to the next person. Yeah. Whereas what a traffic manager is. Yeah. Whereas a traffic manager will take your traffic, work out what is the fastest route for you to talk to your server that you need to get to, and it will pass you to the necessary region and to the necessary service. So as a result, you'll always get the best service for your latency. So if for some reason, something happens with your internet service provider and your ping to EU is actually better than NA, it might actually send you to EU instead of the NA, but your service will be no different. You'll have exactly the same user, the same people, the same everything else. You won't notice any difference apart from you're still getting a nice low ping. And yeah. again, the, the nice thing about traffic manager, though, uh, considering what I just said, was the traffic manager does it on a DNS level. So it it actually happens before you send the packet. So DNS, if not, if some people don't understand, is when you uh, type in, for instance, twitch.tv, um, it converts that into an IP address. So it, 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 you, you send that off to a DNS server. The DNS server then reports back with an IP address that's associated with it. The traffic manager, what it does is it has a list of all the different, from where it is, all the different servers, and it's uh, milliseconds in that. And it then works out using the, the time it takes for you to get to it and then it to get to the server. It can then roughly work out and then point your packets in the right direction. Instead of having to buffer the packet, it, tell, it then sends back an IP address of the local place that you want it to go to. Yeah. So, so it actually result. doesn't add any latency due to that. It's, it's, it adds a slight bit of latency, but not as much as using a load balancer. Yeah. Um, we'll probably have to put some level of load balancing anyway at certain places. Yes, um, um, the API things like that are probably going to have some sort of load balancer, but they don't add much in the way of latency for. Yeah, for those who are really nerdy, um, but I'm not going to go into the real detail on this one. Is we did look at what's called Kubernetes. Oh, I said, why am I saying what's called Kubernetes if I'm saying really nerdy people? It's called Kubernetes. Um, <laughs> it is Kubernetes, um, but because of course we can't load balance on that type of scale for a single container service because people being match made as a team or as rather as a set of 10 have to go on server X. You have to be able to say which container is server X. So as a result, instead of load balancing containers, what we're doing is we're directly tagging containers and saying, you lot are going to use that. So it's more of a matchmaker grabs you, gives you, puts you all in a team of 10 people saying, right, these people will match, or rather two teams of five, and then passes you to the correct server for your region, for your group. You play on that, the server resets, the next batch get put on that server. Yeah. So this is fundamentally working right now. We've spent a lot of time on this. It's not fully tested, and it's a long way off full development completion. But it's, fundamentally, it's the logic's there, steps. and a lot of it um, works. 
yeah, like what we said in the two SOTGs ago, um, we showed off the fact that you can actually um, click a button and it will then deploy. Now, basically, when you click the button, it's actually doing this. It's creating a server on Azure, a container in Azure, running it, and then um, making that available for then the users to be able to see it in that list. Yeah. Basically, our our dev game says so you click a button and it goes, "Hello API, please create me a server." It talks to the container registry. The container registry goes, "Oh yeah, no problem. I'll actually I should, I should redo that." You log in at the game. The game talks to the date to the API. The API talks to the Cosmos DB and says, "Please log me in." Are you my logged in? Yes, I am. So it says, "Yep, congratulations, you're logged in." You go to the development menu. Say, "I would like to log into a server, please." It goes back to the API. The API talks to the container service registry. Sorry. Starts this, says, I want to start a container. It says, here, create this container with this tag. And then this person can then say, okay, well, now I'd like to join that container. And it goes straight to the container and joins the server and you can play a game. Yeah. And this works. Which is it's amazing. So good. And it's fun. It's so fun. And, it means, <laughs> and everybody can try it. And it doesn't cost us an arm and leg. And it means we can do cost analysis actually, as well for what's yeah, it going to cost us to actually touch, run this. Which I think was like 40p for like a day or something. <laughs> Yeah, which is pretty good, in fairness. It's not one pound, was it? One pound for a day, like 40p for like a match. So No, it was less than that. I think, wasn't yeah. it 14p? I can't remember. No. The figures keep moving. We'll have to check it. Yeah. I can't remember. I don't want to give my numbers on stream that aren't right, really. No. So Either way, it's not prohibitively expensive. Not and so long as we get our pricing model working, we want to be open enough to say, look, this is actually what it's costing us to run the game day by day, and this is what we're earning off of you guys. So you can help us keep this game alive if you enjoy it. So once it comes out, it's going to be there. Um, I know we've mentioned this before, but this entire stack is technically optional to the game. So we can actually get rid of it and you can host it locally, but there won't be any actual like competitive mode if we do that. It just means that if the game does actually die, you can still play the game. So it'll never just be off gone and you can never touch it again. It'll be more like the old school games of the 90s where like Quake... Right now, I can go download a copy of Quake, say, I want to make my own server, and it will let me. We're going to allow you to be able to do that. So we're never going to let our yeah. game just die on the shelf yeah. somewhere. The only thing that we'll probably have to do if we do that is patch some, uh, some of the things like logging in and that. That will have to get patched over so it won't try and talk to our servers, basically. But yeah. that will be like a final push before we have to, if ever happens, say, sorry, but we're closing. So Yeah. So that's really nice. Okay, I think we kind of covered everything. And I made some notes about going over maybe what about um, software as a service, platforms as a service, and infrastructure as a service, but I don't really think that's necessary. I think this kind of covers it. So, yeah, I've kind of just made it. Yeah. Yeah. If anyone wants any more detail that we do not cover, you know, throw it either in chat and hopefully we'll pick it up because we've got quite a bit to cover. So we don't want to like hang around too long. There's going to be question answered at the end. So you can answer. Um, if we do miss your question, please throw it again at, us at the end. Or if you really want some real detail that we don't go over on stream, um, throw it into chat in the tech discussion on Discord and uh, we'll, we will come and answer them and uh, yeah, have a chat with you. Yeah, me, Scav, or Zamacha does most of the yeah. chat. Uh, and we can go into a bit more detail as well if you know how specific things do work. Quite happy to do that. So, yeah. let us know. So. so, into our API. So, we keep talking about API. Um, I, I think you know it's something we really need to importantly cover. Um, yeah. It's my baby. <laughs> yeah, I think you spent an awful lot of time on this. So um, an API, <laughs> <laughs> an API is essentially a set of functions and procedures that allow you to uh, create applications that can access sets of data um, of either an operating system, a service, or an application um, remotely. So you're not sort of talking directly to databases and things, it sort of creates this interface where you can call back information or send information to and from a central service. Yeah. I like I like to say that it's basically a whole load of web pages that when you call them, it does something remotely and sends you back some information. The information is all when you look at it, because you can actually call the um, API endpoints just in a web browser and it will show up just a whole load of random garbage. But to the computer, uh, to the game or anything it yeah. is garbage that you can actually read <laughs> yeah so um so what we've done is that basically hard coding is bad if we write all our numbers directly into the engine so if we create a hero and we say right okay ability a does x damage ability b does x damage it has x ability cooldown da, 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 and you stick all these in blueprint variables if i want to go and balance something i've got to go actually into the engine 
to get that number to make the physical change in the engine. Now, if mechanics team are not in the engine, they can't do that themselves. They've got to say, okay, well, what statistics has Aurelia got? Okay, I've got to go in and get all those numbers, give them back to them. Yeah, it's a very manual process and it's not very nice. And it means that if we want to make changes, it's very clumsy and long-winded. This is an awful lot easier. So traditional games, yeah, do that by yeah hard coding directly in. And when you've got a game that doesn't require everyday tweaks to its numbers, it's fine. You know, you look at some of the most you know, brilliant games out there, Stardew Valley. How often do you actually have to change the back end numbers of how much an axe does to a bit of wood? Not often. So I think fairly sim- straightforward. They're probably likely doing it in the actual game programming code. So we want to centralize all that into our API. So the API then has all the statistics. It's all stored in a database. It's all central. We can take all those numbers and we can give them as a bulk to our mechanics team. Yeah, mechanics team can analyze them as a whole. They can tell us what changes they want to make them, and we can allow them to push changes in, or we can push the changes in, and we can handle it in a more. It'll still be handled like a patch system, but it doesn't actually patch anything. All it does is make a change. So what our game does is actually it goes and gets those details at the start of every game. So we can make a change, and next game you play, it'll update those statistics. But we'll have to make sure we do that as a patch, patch system to make sure that everyone's aware of those changes that are happening and when they're happening. So we're not just going to go and drop them on you two seconds flat and then have everyone complain that, oh, you're making changes in this behind the scenes and micro-tweaking. That's not the idea of it. The idea is to make sure that we can do it quickly and easily, but without causing disruption, but making sure we stage it out properly. And it will be tested via like uh, PTR and public testing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it will have a set, so it will go through different part but i will warn you it can get quite fun when it comes to april the first <laughs> oh yeah exactly. uh so but here's the luxury the nice things behind this as no technical physical patches if you download if we change something so if, yeah. let's say we do a patch on mondays every monday and we do the balance of changes on a monday um, i'm not saying we're going to just purely speculative numbers here right um you won't have a patch to download. You'll just have patch notes. You'll know those changes may happen, but you won't necessarily have anything to actually download. So instead of having to download gigs of changes all the time, that's going to happen nice and easy. It's easy for us to make changes. We can make those changes quickly. We can make them in the back end. We, can, we don't need to go hunting through programming code trying to make changes here, there, and all over the place. We can do these in a central management console where we know where everything is happening. And this is everything. So you're talking towers, cooldowns, heroes, abilities, um, respawn times, uh, how long it takes the game to wait before it enters a loading screen. Um, I guess even probably the numbers for your countdowns on on the uh, draft, anything that is a number, we can change in a second. And it's not going to be hard to change, hard to find. And we can do that now, essentially, for a lot of it. Not everything's integrated yet, but it's getting there. And this is one of the well, reasons why... <laughs> yeah, so I'm on the next slide. So we'll get into that. Yeah. Um, and there's a reason for this is why we're going into a certain order. Um, so you've got fast response to balance issues. I think we're all quite aware of other um, MOBAs that have made balance issues and not been able to change them because I've had to push patches out to change things on, on large amounts. Um, we, we have a number that is completely out of whack that is causing us major issues. We can roll that number back very, very quickly. We were um, doing that in development when we were doing the SOTG. The um, towers were, had just stupid range so I oh, yeah. just sat there tweaked the numbers and then we just restarted and it worked fine yeah it's really good so we can we could actually change the tower without recompiling the game without rebuilding the game now every time you rebuild the game when it showed you with jenkins it takes about an hour um and a bit oh, God, yeah. yeah this lets us do it instantly without that rebuild so we can tweak things so much faster we can develop a lot quicker than anyone else um, allows us to so central storage, again, I've mentioned easy to find, so it's fine. Uh, balance team is an independent programming team. It means it takes the weight off the programmers. We don't need to worry too much about how this is being handled, um, about going and get numbers. And we don't have mechanics turn around going, oh, can you go change this for us so we can test it? We don't yeah. have to physically make that change. We, we can, can let mechanics give, do so. We, yeah, we can give mechanics, say, a web page and say, right, do all this, set it up. You put all your numbers in there and then get people to test it. And once they test it and we have like three people wherever many people need to say that it's nice, press that button and everyone will get it. Hmm. And one of the things we're looking at doing this, this is essentially it's in JSON format, so it's a bit like XML, um, oh, I guess, text I document, depending on how far you want to dumb it down. Yeah, I think we have got another slide. Um, I'll cover it anyway. We can always cover it again. Um, so essentially what we want to do is allow you guys to download a copy of the statistics 
So if you think that um, Aurelia is OP, go nerf her yourself. Upload it to a custom server that you can play just yourselves. It won't be ranked or anything, but you can go and test it. If you think actually this works better, you can send it to us and we can have a look at it and analyze it and test it and think, actually, yeah, this person's done a really good balance pass. Let's go put this actually in the game. Or something like that. I can blame you. If it doesn't work. And when it all breaks, then we go, oh, well, that was uh, all my fault. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's good. We can allow people to, to test and do things. So um, it's important. Yeah, the two points I want to make out, these will be structured. Yes, they're easy and quick to do, and there's no patching, so we can do them invisibly. We're not going to do that to you. That's not the plan. We don't want anyone to panic on that. Yeah. Um, and the other one is uh, running games are unaffected by the change. So if you're in the middle of a match and we make a change, it won't affect you. It'll affect you in the next match you play. So that also means that if there's a patch and it's only balance changes, you don't have to log out and back in. You can just go straight into your next match and you won't even notice. Um, so I, I guess there might, there, we'll have to have something on the front page of we'll just a pop-up maybe saying... We'll probably like a notification yeah. or something. I know when I played Guild Wars or something, it would pop up saying, we're going to be doing a change, but that was because you had to shut down the game and restart it. But we could probably put like a little notification pop-up or something yeah. um, to say that it's being done because we can send notifications to everyone. So... Yeah, so we mentioned we've done an awful lot of things, um, and there are a lot of things are integrated, not everything, but most things. Um, uh, a lot of it. Probably about, well, I've written from the past three months about 94 endpoints currently for the API. Yeah. So, so that's it's 94 work, different but... inputs and output. Yeah, so you can call things like uh, the standard one is just logging in, um, but you can then, there's ones for. Um, uh, friends, HUD settings, That's uh, every time you look at the SOTGs, the actual HUD is being downloaded from a default HUD profile and then it actually being rearranged on the screen in front of you as what that is. So we can actually change the HUD and it will come with you across your different games. So if you, for instance, start playing and you have a nice HUD that you like, it will be saved. And then if you go to, say, a friend's house and then play, that HUD will still come with you um, when you want to actually use it. Um, so yeah, I've got World Mechanics, which is what we just talked about. Um, the ones I've been currently working on is the general feedback and player reporting, which is probably what some people have noticed. I did actually do some questions in the um, Discord chat about that. Um, Sounds cool. Uh, launcher files, mailing list, that's actually where we're getting the website up and running now. Um, would be nice uh, once it is what basically you can just put your email in and then we can send you as usual mailing stuff if you if you're interested um the nice thing about this is where the api system really uh, extends because it's basically a http web page anything that's connected to the internet can use it so we can use it across all the different platforms including xbox ps4 computer, Mac, Linux, all of that will connect to it. But it's not just that. We can also use it if ever we get to the point where we want to like make a mobile app or something, we can use it off that. You can then log in using a mobile app. If you're really bored, we could even build something that will fit with your Alexa or Google Home or Discord. We actually are looking um, a center. It's actually in the middle of building the Discord bar, which we plan to actually connect into the API so you can get things like your ELO, your stats, player stats, hero stats, anything like that from there, uh, including yeah. information about items and things like that. I can just imagine playing that loud or something and people are reading off going, Alexa, tell me what my yellow is. Alexa, tell me what <laughs> item X does. It'd be great. Yeah, well. But yeah, so awesome. the nice thing about the API is that because it's con it, it's a, just a basically a HTTP web page, anything to, can connect to it. That if, if it's connected to the internet, for instance, a smartwatch can, is connected to the internet. We can get it to communicate with it. To yeah. the point where I've got a light bulb that's got a bloody little tiny computer in it, uh, that can connect to it. Oh, <laughs> really flash red it. when the core's under attack. Oh, my God. That's what I was planning to do. <laughs> 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 that, or if every time I switch my light on in the room, it's going to send a bug report to us. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Um, so, yeah. yeah, so this is this is one of the reasons, though, if you look at these integrated systems in this particular order, of why they were, why we've done things in the order we have. So I know we've come under fire a little bit for criticism for why the HUD is there before things like XP and currency. But realistically, this all comes down to uh, what is essentially the user's profile. So as a user, you need to be able to log in. You need to have a name and a password 
and you need to be able to play the game. So that was really our first goal. Let's get people in the actual game and we know who they are. So that each person running around the map has their own name above their head and statistics. So that's the kind of thing what we wanted first. Now the interesting thing about that was the HUD system kind of directly interfaces with that authenticated user. Whereas something like world mechanics, which are, you know, things like um, uh, towers and minions are in independent of the player, but again, are their own feature. Currency, XP, um, the item shop itself to a certain extent, all tie back into the hero and the hero ties into the player. Yeah, So the player is playing as player X, that, player need, that hero needs um, X amount of currency, X amount of XP, X amount of everything else, every single game. So we needed to implement them in a certain order to make sure that we could tie those straight into the API properly in the correct order. Otherwise, we'd end up going out to retrofit things. <laughs> Sorry, and the one thing we wanted to avoid from the start is going back and retrofitting code because it adds more development time when we don't need to create that development overhead. So it all has to come together to create the game in the end. So why spend, yes, okay, maybe a couple of hours creating an XP system, but if we have to go back and rechange that entire XP system, what was the point? Just so we can show it off on, on a video, it, it that seems pointless to me. So we didn't do it. So as a result, this is this is why this is in this order. So authentication, your basic account details, your friend system, your HUD system, these are all tied in. Um, chat's also working. Um, oh, it's on the next system. Um, next slide, sorry. So these are all tied into you know, you as a player, and and they're important to be to you as a player. Um, now we're getting further on down that point where the hero, the ability system, uh, all that's tying into each other. You're going to find a lot more of the features coming in and being uh, working, um, which really comes into what we're really working on right this at this second. This is where we are now. So we're getting IAI improvements in camps. Um, really, that's been ongoing from the start. Um, yeah. And doesn't really tie into the API as well. No, it does because all the minions and things do tie into the API because all their statistics come yeah, from it. I think we're currently working on trying to get the. Uh, we had a little problem where it's, the data was being downloaded, but then it was uh, into the spawn point of the minion, but the minion wasn't actually getting the uh, data applied to it. Yeah, I think we're still having problems with them not actually spawning at the moment properly, so we need to fix that yeah, one. But yeah, not quite sure another, <laughs> another bug. I just haven't had time to look at it yet. It's been a hell of a week. Um, what was supposed to be small jobs this week turned into huge ones. So never mind. Uh, the UI is still in the yeah exactly. Uh, UI is still in development, but again, all ties back to the a API. So it's all statistics. It's all saved. You can move your HUD around. So if you want your bottom right corner because you're a streamer and you can want it free, you can do. If you don't care about that and you want to put your mini map in the bottom right, you can. It's up to you. If you want to have and it goes with you. Yeah, and it goes with you wherever you go. So if you delete your game and reinstall it, you get it back. If you go cross platform, yeah, you get it all as well. If you don't like customizing your um, HUD with the controller, use a mouse and keyboard and then log in as the other device. Whatever. It's all good. So it's all going to work. XP and economy um, is well underway. Um, hopefully, we'll have something to show on that very soon. Um, but again, it's all statistically tied the to the API. going to be an interesting one. Yeah, hopefully. I hope it's ready for the next uh, state of the game. If it's not, it's not. It doesn't matter. But it would no. be really nice. So, uh, oh yeah, good God, this is this is what I'm doing. So I just noticed that someone said you love your backend systems. Yes, yes, we do. This is what we do. We this is why we're the programming team. Because this is what we do. And this is why nobody talks about this stuff. Because... We love it. We it. Get, it's orgasmic um, to us, but nobody else cares. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been working on this thing for the past three months, and it has been an absolute joy to work with, and I absolutely love it. But then the problem is, as I keep telling everyone, and I keep posting this picture, all anyone sees of the back-end system is an Ethernet cable, because that's all you're ever going to see. Yeah. So, Our systems yeah. are all in the cloud, out of the way, and if you see it, then there's usually a problem. Uh, so towers are getting finishing touches, but they're virtually working, which is really cool. So actually, technically, the tower, um, which goes to uh, tier one, tier two, tier three, the inhibitors and uh, the core, are all technically the same tower blueprint. But when you when you deploy it, you tell it what it is, and then it goes and gets the right statistics and its right appearance and its correct meshes from the API and things. So they kind of change depending on which ones you pick. Um, so that's quite nice. It's all sort of integrated into a single blueprint. So the nice thing about this, which I think we should probably cover earlier on, really, is um, when we talk about class. Uh, so base and class blueprints, uh, like the hero. So Aurelia is a um, is a child of BP Hero. So our hero blueprint is the basic. And if we make a change to that hero, or if we make a change to you know the first tower in this case, every tower in, in the game and every hero in the game gets made gets hit by that change. So instead of us having to go through and make a change into if we end up with I don't know 100 heroes and we want to change one little thing, um, 
we can make that in one place and it replicates down to every single one below it. So it's an awful lot quicker and easier than messing around with go through and manually change every single part bit. It's just not <laughs> practical in the long term. Yeah. Uh, the website is actually being in finishing touches. The reason the website was delayed was um, probably my fault. Um, one, I don't want to do anything that's half-baked. Um, I don't want to put something out there that's insecure, uh, just hard to maintain, adds more work than we need to be. Um, I'd rather create something that's going to be an awful lot easier to do um, in the long term and is going to be really integrated into everything. So that's the, one of the main reasons. But the second part was that we came by and we felt that actually we need that VG staff to be able to register and to create a few things and do things that no one else can do. Um, to be able to test the game, to be able to download a copy, to be able to know if they're a developer or not, that kind of stuff. So I had now nah, working on all that back end stuff that you guys aren't going to see yet. Um, you will eventually, but not yet. Um, yeah, so we kind of developed, so we things like that, being able to so see who's what. Yeah, so we've done a lot of back end website work instead of the front end work. So it means that we've sort of delayed the advertising bit, but it's it'll be with you very soon. Um, he's back on that full time now, so it won't be long. Um, animation codes. Wow, there's a lot of this. God. God, um, yeah. You, you started a... it and then quick went over to it, didn't you? Oh, he's, like... he's blown me well out of the water as far as I need to get on board <laughs> and, and learn what he's what he's done. It's amazing. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm not going to give too much away on what it actually does at the moment. You're all going to see it soon enough. Um, but it's coming. It's there. It's in, it's in the works. There's a lot of uh, stuff going on there. Aurelia's kit slowly in development um, to get it fully operational because she's going to be our first fully operational hero in the game. Um, controller input so we can actually use controllers. It's it's kind of there now. It does kind of half work. It's not yeah, it's not finished. I want to implement some bits and pieces for being able to uh, store controller and also key bindings on your profiles as well. As about to mention, we haven't quite done that yet. We need to get that tied in, don't we? Yeah, I. I yeah. I started looking to it, but I got moved over to doing this. Um... Yeah. So, um... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fair enough. So, yeah, health and manner indicators, mini map observers, player feedback, bug reports. These are for, you know, early access alpha testing. Um, so, I'm not giving you a date yet, but we're getting, we're, you know, we're working on alpha features. So, we're, we're excited at least. Um, we want to make sure that when you report a bug, it doesn't crash. And not only that, is that it tells us what the bug is you're reporting it, so we don't want you to forget later. Uh, we want to, we want you to push to us when the bug happens, and then we can grab exactly what happened when that hap- when that crash happened, or when that problem happened, or whatnot. So that's slowly building. So that's coming soon. And the chat system. Um, you might want to talk about that because that's really exciting. I'm quite impressed. That is nice. It's another nice feature that's uh, coming a long way. Yeah, it's getting there. It's it's. <laughs> I came back to it a couple of days ago, and I got a message from Quicks because saying the chat, uh, the entire game is crashing because the chat system is giving this error, and it was like overflow. It was like the entire uh, server was just overloaded somehow. But it's like, well, it's fine. It, it seemed to sort itself out. So that's okay. Yeah. But yeah, the chat system is currently set up as a global chat, so any game can communicate with any. It's actually its own separate server, and the one thing I am really pleased about is that we're actually using the same system that both WhatsApp and LOL are using. So think of it that way. Yeah, it's pretty but good. No, we're but, not going to be looking into end to encryption just yet, but it's there. <laughs> well, I don't think we need the end to end encryption really for chat because you shouldn't be chatting about stuff in game you shouldn't be talking about anyway. It's so it's more, not so much fun. it's more about the fact that it can be globally scaled, which is actually something yeah. that we have in the back end and infrastructure side have been really working on the ability to be able to scale globally this this game can run yes if you it, it's easy to get a game to run in the same room or the same country but to get it to run across the globe it's a lot of planning and a lot of work which has taken time it took me nearly three four weeks just to work out which database we were going to use to be able to scale globally which is where we came to using uh, cosmos but Things like that. It's just working out how to get it to scale globally. But the nice thing about this as well, it's also knowing about it. It's also multi multi device as well, so you can get yes. your chat on your phone, um, and it will come up in game. That would be or... nice because yes, um, it, it's it's it uses systems that WhatsApp, so we can actually port chat yeah. over to say the web page or the phone or whatever, and do or the launcher, thing. the website, whatever. <laughs> so we can we can yeah. It's like a full, fully grown friend system, not just a thing. Uh, somebody's asking about yeah. voice chat in um, 
in chat. Uh, voice chat, um, we haven't actually got a decision on it. We can do it. There's nothing stopping us. Um, it's just, I don't think anyone's actually said we on. No one's made a decision whether we are or not. I, well, I have nothing against it, but I don't know. The VoIP is one of these things where we're going to have to do a lot of work to get it to work nicely and also to be scalable. Um, There is, we, as people have probably noticed, we have actually got Discord integration working. I actually Mm. did that in an evening because I got bored. Uh, (laughs) I don't know why. (laughs) Um, But yes, you can actually see what player a person's playing at. I like that. It shows you the hero. Game, things like that. Yeah. yeah. I only found out though that we we're only allowed like two hundred uh, little images from Discord. So yeah, we're so not we have, have more than two hundred players, uh, two hundred um, heroes just yet. So at least not in the short term. No. Um, yeah. So yeah. Uh, voice chat. We'll, we'll get round to it. Get uh, at least in the short term. No, but long term, probably. Who knows? Probably. I would like to see it in there. It would just take a little while. Public API. People have asked this because they like the Gora.gg and things like that. We will have a public API, so these things will be possible. We're not we going to hide nice. figures. Sorry, yes, we are not going to be like we, we're not we're not going to hide anything. It, I've always said, and this is the one thing that when I was working on both the internal API and I would like to hopefully, if allow me, to work on the API publicly as well. I don't like hiding figures. I want people to have as much control as whatever they want. If they want to log in, we will probably give someone have access to be able to use a OAuth server to be able to log in using our system. Being able to see all the ELOs, things like that, even to the point where giving use, uh, third parties the ability to pull all of the information about the stats and all of these balancing values will, get, uh, will be able to be viewed publicly in real time. So when we change them, they will be able to get that change instantly. So when they do like a page or a a builder, an item builder or something like that, you will actually see those changes come straight in from when we hit that button to say go. It means that technically the other people can audit us. So if we're making promises that we're not going to change things and no one's going to notice, you you, you're going to be able to know from our public API if a figure changes, it's going to you know third parties are going to find out and call us out on it. So we will be sticking to what we say. Don't worry about it. But theoretically, yeah. you shouldn't need third parties too much because we are going to put all our statistics on our own website too. So you're going to yeah. be able to get all that from our own places, not from you know all over the web. You you will have a standard ELO. So you're not going to have to have people guessing what your ELO should be. It will be the ELO that we use in game, that kind of stuff. And you'll be able to compare that to your actual site. Um, again, replays and things we're looking at. So all those kind of statistics and numbers and figures and URLs will all be saved. So it'll all yeah. be good. Okay, what else we got? Uh, yeah, on a single login for all visionary game services. So again, you know, we're talking about multiple devices. We're talking about you know multiple website, you know, the website, the launcher, the same login for the lot. So this all goes through the same system. So you can log Maybe into a mobile all. app later on. You know, well, one of the things I like about the mobile app, this is not a promise, just an idea, but something I'd like it's to do. Just an idea. It's something, it's yeah. something that we can do with the. Um, yeah, I've got a. That's the one nice thing I want to actually point out is that the public API. If we do, when we do systems like this, we might actually, or I'm definitely any sort of main app, or if we ever do a uh, mobile app, we'll use the public API as the thing. So we will actually be using our own in-house systems with the public API. So it's all tested without having to worry about third parties coming in and finding that there's issues. Everything that we will give to the public will be used by us as well. Hmm. Um, yeah, as like I said, I just, you kind of have to preempt sometimes. These are just ideas because people get the wrong idea occasionally. But um, yeah, really importantly, um, really importantly, yeah, this is just an idea. But something I've always wanted to do about this game is to make it streamer friendly. You know, the, um, esports, uh, competitive gameplay, um, just streaming in general for fun has become such a big deal these days. I think it's really important that. Um, VG support streaming as a as a product as as some, as a service that people want to do. Um, so I was looking at ways that we can handle sort of draft dodging a little bit because I know a lot of uh, professional players put dodge screens, which kind of breaks from the immersion to the server game, you know, to the actual integration with the actual uh, streamer, uh, and I think that's not a good thing. So I was looking at whether or not we could tie in our matchmaker 
to, or not the matchmaker, but the draft to a mobile app. So if you had a mobile on the desk in front of you with the draft on it, and you could pick your hero and roles and things on your phone, and it affects the game, but the game has a streaming mode, so it hides all like the player names and things. So if you're streaming that game, the players on stream don't know who you're playing against. They can't stream snipe you. But what they can do, what you, but you still have control of your game. So that I think would be a really amazing thing to do. But again, it's just an idea, and whether or not it's something we can do in the in the long term is. It's a bit far well, out there, but with, with the stuff we've got, we, it, it is possible to do. It's just it's theoretically, you need yeah. To spend the time working on getting the game running first, and then once oh yeah, it's it, far more important things to do. In, yeah, because I, I would like to see if um, if we do ever get to the esports side, and this is really going to be bad, um, is giving the admins opportunity to be able to get see information about the game being streamed live from the actual clients. So they can then actually use that to then do whatever they need to do with overlays and things like that with their own systems. Yeah. Okay, what's going on? Your phone. <laughs> we oh. wish. <laughs> <laughs> what? You... you won't get to play on your phone, but you'll be able to at least. I don't know, PUBG, stuff. PUBG runs on a phone. I don't know how do they do that. God, don't, please don't. I don't want to get into this yet. <laughs> no, not yet. Who knows? When we all get bored and we're like, what can we do next? Tell you what, let's make a mobile version. Now, nah, we'll see. Um, who knows? <laughs> but I don't know. But, um, we'll see. I think we've covered a lot of this, actually. But um, I'll just sort of run over it quick. Uh, custom games. Uh, we're going to have custom games. Oh, no, I guess we can cover custom games in a bit more detail. No, we haven't the idea is to... Yeah, the idea is to create a bit like an Overwatch custom game system. So you know you can log in and you can have your own teams and you can choose who does what and you can change some of the statistics yourself. Um, we only have a whole balance file as well if you like. But also maybe custom game modes, things like that. Um, one of the other things I like to I have the idea of is not only just allowing you to, guys to ho- host uh, local listen servers, so you can have like a LAN server that you can run yourself or just play with your friends. Um, I wanted the idea of. Um, that you can pay us to host a game for you. So we know how much one of those containers we were talking about earlier is going to cost us to run. So you could say, spend, I don't know, whatever it is, five coins in game to, ha- to host a match. So we'll host it on one of our servers, but you and your friends can all play on it custom. Um, so it's not costing anyone um, too much to do, and it's not going to you know break the game, that kind of stuff. I don't know. It's, these are ideas. I don't know whether it will happen. But either way, we're definitely going to do some way around custom servers that you can host them and, yeah, and play the with your friends. To be able to give you control over balancing figures is something that we all would like to see. Mm. Of course, this will be separate to ranked. So yeah, yeah, that's cool. So that's there. Um, easy to test balance with API numbers we covered. PTI and dev branching. Yeah, so we're going to have testing we're not just going to go dropping into live um yeah okay there's going to be a point in the process where this comes online it's obviously not going to be alpha the whole point of alpha is it is testing but once we get towards something that we can release that is what we're going to do uh statistical analysis i know we all like to make fun of data because data was the word data was thrown around way too much in the past but um we're gonna have to do some um but we're kind of going to share those figures with you we're not just gonna say well our data says this no well no we're seeing this trend what do you all think yeah yeah so yeah but we are doing it and this is all being integrated at the moment um it's all getting kind of put in um into the api now so we can do some analysis i think you've done a lot of this recently haven't you oh well i've done some framework based stuff but i'm having to wait until we actually get some sort of gameplay or game system working before i can really put much in more into it ah cool so yeah um and we're going to get people to come in and test for us you know pro players um public players of all ranks just to have a play with it and see what they think and, and, and help us get a good game balance from the get-go and, and going forward. Um, again, you know, this is further down the road, not on short timescales, but I want you to let you know that we are going to do that and it is coming soon. So that's nice. Uh, security, I think this was a really important topic because um, especially those of us who work in any tech field these days know how important yeah. security is. Um, GDPR legislation, compliance, and the whole penetration testing. I spend an <laughs> enormous amount of time at work working on security testing, penetration testing, and hacking. Um, it's crazy. Uh, so we are security conscious from the get-go. Um, we are making sure that we develop it and test it in a secure way, that we make sure it is. We're making sure that whoever we use for payment gateways is reliable and, and is going to protect you guys. We are not going to share any your data. We're not even going to collect any data that we don't need off you. Um, we're going to want bare essentials, essentially, for what we need for for those compliance requirements. All we really need in the profile is a first name, last name, and email. 
Yeah, it's exactly. So, but we'll provide ways of like multi-factor authentication and all that kind of thing, so you can definitely go oh, back yeah. to your account, and that we can identify you, so you don't lose access to control of your account if someone hacks it. But we're not going to go and ask you for your mother's maiden name of your third grandmother or something stupid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of places collect too much information and then go, oh, we can't comply with compliance anymore. We're going to have to shut down. We're not going to get into that situation in the first place. It's just stupid. No, that's my point. And why do we want to share with third parties? We're not trying to. You know, we're trying to make a game we all enjoy, right? Not just not just for you guys. We're making this because we want to make it. We want to play it. If only seventy people who are working on the game end up playing this, we'll probably be quite happy <laughs> because yeah. we want to play it. So great. So we're not looking at selling your data to third parties or anything like that. It's just you know we're not here for the money or all the greed or anything else. And hence the debate in the uh, channel is going on. Um, yeah. So that's cool. <laughs> demonic trail uh, scab hacker confirmed yeah it always annoys me when you go to these conferences and they show pictures of hackers and they've got like black hoodies and things I don't even have a black hoodie so yeah and uh, yeah so we'll have a lot of policies and things coming up um, soon they'll be on the website uh, privacy policy security policy cookie policy GDPR compliance policy you get the idea if you're interested they will be there for you to read them you'll be able to see what we're going to do and what we're not um, terms and conditions all that jazz but yeah just be aware we are looking after you guys from a security perspective and from a um, a data perspective, you know, we wouldn't want to want our details leaked somewhere by some third party. We're making sure that doesn't happen to you guys. And if we even if we are using OAuth from third parties, we won't be storing SSS data from them either. So if we have say, um, uh, Facebook login, uh, it will literally be tied to your email address. We're not going to go grab all your profile friends, friends and stuff. Which There's no need for that. It's need... ridiculous. We it should go without that. saying, shouldn't it? Yeah, no. But it, it doesn't because companies do it. It drives me yeah, mad. Yeah, it's like, oh. Well, well. Yeah, so happens. we're going to be doing that. <laughs> and that is pretty much the end of our fairly longer than I planned back end sort of system overview without going into any actual code and things. So I don't want to blow anyone's minds with this is how you do this particular bit or run into like four hour long streams. So, um,. Yeah, any questions, and we will go over them. Yeah, if any of the staff want to come into the stream channel... Yeah, you could have done it all the time, by the way. We are in. We jumped in the channel yeah. for that reason. So if you want to come talk so, to us, you know, do, so, do so, it is fine. Uh, what's this? Oh, bot games. Do we want to talk about the bots and what we're thinking of them? Well, we're going to have bots. Um, yeah. Won't be, won't well, be no, just bots. Was... Bot game, bot games are harder to do than player games. Yeah. You do realize this, so we're going to be doing players first. But yeah, we're going to be getting bots as well. Oh, hello, Almighty. Is he <coughs> on the stream? Ah, hey, he's there. Lee. No. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Anna Megan. <laughs> All right. So does anyone got any questions? Um, I will see. The stream has died. It's gone dead. Come on, people. You must have something. Um. Why has Lee died? Are we going to do cut and paste codes from other bits of kits? Well, that really comes down to master designers rather than programming code. We can't cut and paste code. Um, whether or not abilities will be the same as other heroes from other MOBAs, you're going to have some abilities probably get replicated because it's it's Inevitable. There's so many hundreds and hundreds of heroes out there with abilities. How can you avoid them all these days? Everything is allegory. Yeah, it's <laughs> just one of those things. Are you guys um, going to have a game mode to test decks and see which more damage and health they do? Yeah, since that's what custom yeah. game mode does. You'll um, you have bot games as well, but yes, you you can use custom games to put your own players into your own custom game. Like a listen server that is unranked and you can test what I you like in it. Maybe have a look at like unlocking certain things or something, so... You you should be able to access items and that that you might not have locked um, yeah, to be able to actually good. test them out before you unlock them or get them. Yeah, I think there was discussion about having a sandbox mode where you can try out any hero you want, even if you don't have them unlocked, if we're going that route or whatever. I thought um, we were, I can't remember what we were doing with the way of locking heroes, but yeah, I thought, I thought yeah, they were unlocked. I'm still unsure. I thought they were unlocked, but, but hey, whatever. If we're going that way, that's <laughs> how it's working. But, you know. 
Are you planning anything like summoners in League of Legends? So I guess that's like more of a lore question. Yeah, it's a master's. Is... Yeah. yeah. Uh, as for copy and pasting the, code for abilities, I mean abilities might work off of other other systems, I guess. Yeah, I mean you know always the problem. There's a difference between artists and programmers. Programmers will reuse code where we can, whereas artists tend to rewrite from scratch. Um, so yeah, I mean there's going to be times where we'll probably reuse work we've already done. That's just kind of the nature of programming. You class things so that you can recall the same piece more than once. Um, kind of depends on the on the requirement really at the time. Mm-hmm. Stack Overflow is your friend. Exactly. <laughs> it's all full of people copying and pasting their code. <laughs> that and the UE forums. So useful. Mm-hmm. Bennett, it's like... Either we've blown everyone's minds, or no one has any questions. I think you yeah, answer everything. Always positive, anyway. Well, anything gameplay related is probably a bit more irrelevant to this particular conversation, mm-hmm. anyway. So. Our coding team is so efficient, guys. <laughs> it surprisingly is. I mean, I know it's all the conversation where people saying we'd do a lot better if we were working on this full time. To be honest, a lot of the people here are doing a lot of hours on this. It's not like we're just sat around, you know, doing an hour a day or, or 10 minutes a day or something in between your lunch break. It, people are sitting on this for hours and hours and hours. They're staying up late and doing a lot of work. Mm-hmm. So. You all are mad. You guys are mad. Yeah, they are. <laughs> okay, Amazingly I think. Amazingly mad. That's a good combination. What did you guys think of that? Was it alright? Yeah. While well, I was watching half of it just on my phone on my way home, I actually <laughs> really like just listening to it as like a VOD kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I did say at the start, this is going to be very dry, very long. Um, so if that kind of stream wasn't for you, then get off now. <laughs> I think but, it was uh, interesting. Oh, good. I think for a lot of people, it would be quite interesting. Especially if wow. know, like, it's hard not showing the actual code and things to really prove what we're doing, but I think you know I wanted to sort of come up with a way of addressing why things have been done in a certain order, and uh, there's a lot of people out there who seem to think they have a bit of knowledge about game development or some, or at least a, an opinion on it, um, and not really understand what programming you're doing. And this isn't the kind of thing that companies generally do, so I thought it was a bit unusual and uh, be a bit of fun. So yeah, because we don't usually see a um, game company well. Yeah, never, never learn a game company. Something uh, like doing like this that shows off exactly what the back end and everything that fits together to actually do this that you're never going to see actually is how it works. In that, yeah. Oh. All right. <laughs> okay. If we're all happy, um, we can end it there then. I think. Um, yeah. there's a question for I guess Demonic if he wants to answer it. What's that? Uh, are we gonna have harvesters or gold drip like in Paragon? There's different ways we're trying to think about having gold drip, uh, maybe through like items or whatever. But that we do have um, haggis going through documents and stuff about how that's gonna work. Harvesters is still something I'm not too sure on. There's objectives, but they're not really defined of how they're going to work. We know we want something, I think, isn't it? Am I right yeah. in saying? But we don't know what. Yeah. Is it right in that? Like, something like that. Something to contest over to make sure it's not just go left lane gank, go right lane gank, push a tower. Just the same thing over and over again. This needs to be more objectives, especially for a jungler, because Paragon was quite re- rinse and repeat kind of thing. If we're going to talk a little bit about mechanics, am I right in saying I saw something the other day that gives support something to do while they're supporting at the start in the laning phase? It, I don't want to give anyway too much detail away, but I was quite intrigued. I thought it was quite interesting. It was kind of more like um, how League has item gold drip items. Uh, so okay. the, the supports can go roam a bit more instead of just being sat in one lane to be effectively a second jungler. Okay. Cool. Um, uh, we got a question. How are the animations going? We've only seen two of Magnus. Uh, yeah, they're a lot. They're an awful lot further on along than we've originally shown now. Um, those Definitely. those two original uh, Aurelia animations were very very early on, and it was just I wanted to show you guys something that, because we hadn't given anything on animation at all. Um, but yeah, it's definitely coming along a lot further. Um, 
probably next day at the game, guys. We'll show a bit more information on that. I feel sorry for you, Lee. My uh, Quicks has been doing a lot of bugging, hasn't he? Huh? <laughs> He's been bugging you a lot for the uh, IK. Yeah. Well, I mean, not Travis. Like, yeah, it's like it's like you know, I'm kind of a go between between him and and the uh, the riggers and stuff at the moment. It's all right though. <laughs> Mind you, saying that once we've got the technology working in in game, it's going to be a lot lot easier for the next one. Yeah, it's, we know it's we one need. of these things where like. At the moment, it's really frustrating because it feels like, you know, you take one step forward and then something changes, you take two steps backwards. But once it is done and once we've got it all figured out, like, um, all of the stuff that he's doing now, like, that will just kind of belong in the master blueprint. So you'll never have to do it again. And we can just make sure that all of the future rigs conform to the same standard and everything. Yep. So it should be cool. Hello, mate. Hello. Okay. Well, hey. Hi, May. Greetings. Any questions? Didn't watch the stream. Doesn't know probably. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are in the stream chat. Wanted to hang out. Uh -oh. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, thank you all for tuning in. I think we've kind of exhausted all the questions that are coming out of uh, stream chat. So if you have any in the future, we're going to put this on YouTube. So. Um, Ask us there. But uh, as mentioned before, um, there's a tech channel in the Discord. So drop us any questions you have, and we're happy to join them and answer them and you know, get involved with you guys. So thank you for joining. Yep. Don't forget to congratulate May on her brand new vacuum cleaner. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> Don't forget to say your condolences to May's lack of coffee table. Yeah. <laughs> lack oh, I got one yesterday. Oh, man. Yeah, no, I have no industry. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>